I'm reading a bit here from uh, my new book, Priya, Priya in Incredible India. And uh, this is a book that picks up some strands and characters uh, from uh, an older novel called Paro. And Paro, Dreams of Passion was in fact my first novel written, um, published 27 years ago or something like that. And uh, it's fun to go back to some of those characters and situations again. So the bit I'm going to read out now has uh, the voice of this novel, Priya, um, is, is gone to Bombay and she is meeting up with her uh, ex-boss and ex-lover, um, B.R., who, who, as you will find, will become her lover once again. So here's Priya in Mumbai that once was Bombay. There was a mosquito buzzing around the room, the only irritant in a world of grace and serendipity. I ordered a pot of Darjeeling tea and luxuriated in the moment. You've arrived, Priya Kaushal, I told myself, as I preened before the misted over antique mirror. In the dim light, with the curtains drawn, I looked rather good. Love had made one of his mysterious disappearances, muttering about elusive friends in Kolaba. On an impulse, I picked up the leather-bound telephone directory nestling besides Gideon's Bible and an abbreviated Bhagavad Gita. Sita sewing machines. There was no entry under the head. I persisted, squinting through my reading glasses under the bedside lamp until I discovered the name I was looking for, the marine drive address. Then I rang the number. Hello, 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 hello on the other side, from what sounded like Nepali cocoa bearer. May I speak to BR, sir, please, I requested, nervously reverting to the role of secretary, factotum and part-time lover. There was a moment of silence, and then the beloved fruity voice, which still had the power to make me swoon. Who is this, please? Calling in a landline in the age of cellular communication, he asked. It's me, sir, Priya, Priya Kaushal. I'm calling from Mumbai, I murmured, apologetically. Why was I still calling him, sir? Priya, my love, how delicious to hear a voice. What a delectable surprise, he said. And when do I have the honor and the privilege of seeing you in person? It's been so long, much too long. My stomach was feeling funny. It was quickening and contracting in pleasurable spasms. I couldn't think of what to say. It had been more than 25 years ago. How about this evening, BR persisted. Where are you staying, Priya? In the Taj, the old Taj, I replied, sounding more assertive than a humble office assistant now. Delighted. I shall meet you in the lobby at the very dot of seven, he said, and put the phone down. The awards function had, had come to grace, was scheduled for the next morning. I shook off my brother, calling him and cancelling the dreary, predictable evening that stretched ahead. The past awaited me in the lobby at seven. I was there at a quarter to. BR arrived on the dot. Nothing about him had changed except that he was leaning on an ivory cane. He stood before me and our eyes met. Time stood very still for a while. His smile was both knowing and tender. Priya, my darling, he murmured, we meet again. No point rec recounting what we did next, the conversation and the two martinis and the bottle of wine and the dim sown feast or the familiar lavender notes of his cologne, or how he stro stroked my arm in the lift as he saw me back into my room. I forgot that I was an Indian wife and mother, and I did not think of love and when he might return to his room from Kolaba or wherever he was. All I can remember is that we were in the room, in a clinch, and then I was naked and he was too, and the ivory cane leaned against the mattress as I surrendered to love and sex and re-seduction. It was raining outside, a furious monsoon, monsoon downpour, and the curtains had not been drawn. A flash of lightning illumined B.R.'s face. He was looking up at the ceiling as though searching for something. I could imagine the Arabian Sea outside, the waves rising and falling as the furious rain beat down and the thunderous sky lit up and was dark again. B.R. sighed. Here we are, Priya, he said, older but no wiser. There was no rapture in his voice, but a note of regret. A reformed smoker who has lit up again. Then his practiced seducer's etiquette took over. Was it good for you, he inquired, stroking my shoulders and pumping my breasts in a distracted sort of way. 
It was wonderful, I murmured. I mean, really wonderful. And I meant it. As usual, as forever, BR held the keys. We lay entwined in each other's arms. I could feel every cell in my body, every pore in my skin, celebrating. Another flash of lightning streaked the room. I saw again, flashed against the dark, the ivory cane propped against the bed, his face in shadow, and the curve of my arm as I embraced him. Independence Day, I told myself aloud, though very softly. BR seemed not to have heard me. Perhaps I'd only thought it, not said it at all. The room bell trilled. I froze up, though BR continued to stare at the ceiling as his fingers absently stroked my naked back. I leapt out of bed, dropping the cane, which rolled under the bed. Who is it? I asked in panic through the shut door. Was it? Could it be love? Room service, madam, a suave voice replied. Your order, madam. It's a wrong room, please, I shouted, the panic not far from the surface of my voice. Wrong room, can you hear me? We didn't order anything. BR got up and sat by the edge of the bed. Another flash of lightning and his face again, like a photograph in an album, to be remembered and cherished. The sound of the rain knocking on the Taj roof, rat-a-tat-tat. I forgot the do not disturb sign, BR pronounced at last. I knew I had forgotten something. I'm getting forgetful in my old age. What did that mean? And where is my cane, Priya? You seem somehow to have misplaced it. There was a querulous, petulant note in his voice, an old woman's voice. BR winced as I switched on the bedside lamp. I bent down to retrieve the cane. It had rolled deep under the bed. I was naked on all fours. My once firm bum, now rattled with orange peel cellulite, stuck out like a vanquished emblem of desire. The soft pile carpet stroked my skin as I tried anxiously to position an arm under the bed. There were two scrunched up plastic bags breathing gently under the bed. And a condom? Two condoms and an empty can of Coke. The cane remained just out of reach. Finally, I got a shoehorn from the old fashioned cupboard in the dressing area and used it successfully to maneuver the cane out. Then I returned to the bed and switched the light off. There was a patch of light from the bathroom, an irregular cube which framed the sounds of BR's toilet. I could hear him shuffling back into his trousers, brushing his teeth in the bathroom. Was he using my brush? I switched on the bedside lamp again and settled myself seductively against the pillows, arraying my hair in a casual halo. He didn't take much notice. These fragments I shall shore up against my ruin, he declaimed. That's T.S. Eliot, my dear, in case you didn't know. I must go now. I will call you again tomorrow, Priya, my love. And he was gone. So that's a bit where we go back to Priya's past. So um, 1984 was when Paro um, was released. Mm -hmm. And it's been 27 years. Yes. So was it um, always imminent that you're going to that that book is going to have a sequel or was it something that just clicked recently in your head you know um, power was a book which I left behind both consciously and subconsciously after I wrote it that's because uh, I, I wasn't prepared for the success it got yeah. and I also wasn't prepared for the very reactions. very negative reactions I mean I was called a pornographist by my daughter's kindergarten teacher I was, it, it had a very violent sort of reaction from middle class India mm. and also from the literary critics. So mm. I just mm. sort of retreated into hiding and began writing very what I thought were serious books. Yeah. And uh, recently I read an essay by a critic who said, Namita Gokhale is an example of a novelist who changed her voice. So I don't think my voice changed, but if people thought so. And then I have a dear friend who's a journalist mm. and who doesn't read much. So he said, Namita, I mean, he doesn't read. So I have a dear friend who's a journalist and who doesn't read much uh, literary fiction. Mm. So he pointed out that uh, all my novels have a lot of sex in them, but Paro was the most interesting and the rest are somehow boring. Uh, this was his take. I mean, I don't buy that. Mm -hmm. And he said, why don't you go back and do Son of Paro? I said, don't be stupid. I've left Paro behind. You know? And I, I got really irritated. I mean, this was a subject of 
an extremely angry um, rejoinder on mm. my part saying that this is the worst idea I've ever heard. But you know how the worst ideas <laughs> one has ever heard sit like a kida in your brain and they sort of mm. play their way out. Mm. So I still remember on a flight back from South Africa taking out a notepad and beginning on this novel. Okay. And, so, and it's interesting that you chose Priya, you know, because one of the, I remember reading a couple of reviews of the book and a lot of people seem to think, most people love the book, seem to think that the one flaw in the book is that Priya, there's very little of Priya, even though it's her point of view, she is very detached, you know, and we, we don't just, we just seem, don't seem to know her well enough, uh, you know, and that was, that was a lot of critics felt that they wanted more of Priya in that book. So it's very interesting that it was that a, a natural choice? Well, I don't know how perverse these critics are going to be when they get more of Priya, frankly. Because um, even in the first one, she was the voice of that voyeur, that diarist, that, that sense of the novelistic skill yeah. of the person who's always staring at other people. Yeah. And in this novel, she's also, in that sense, a negative character. In the sense that she's more observing and reacting hmm. than leading Thanks. the action. Okay. And, uh, but her voice is a continuation of the same voice. I think that the same voice is working again. And uh, I have tried to graph some sort of growth mm. within Priya in the book. Mm. Of it, It's a book about coming to terms with middle age. Mm. And it's a book about coming to terms with the new India. Mm. So in that, I hope we sort of see Priya's point of view. Mm. a little more mm. than we did in part. The, the inevitable question of time, right? 27 years. Two things very distinctly have changed, have evolved. One is the society that you're writing about, mm -hmm. the times you're writing about, the political, social culture. And second is the way in which you see them. I mean, definitely philosophically, um, psychologically, the way you react to everything. Um, and the way you reacted in your 20s when you were writing Paro has obviously changed a lot. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Um, as a novelist, I would say that the first novel yeah. was written with that magical spontaneity which first novels do sometime achieve. Which was all over the book. I mean, which is just... just which came, was a part yeah, of the book, yeah, you know. Yeah. It, it happens yeah. in the first book of yeah. a certain type. And, and this book, when it goes back to it, it's also a, an exercise to take that voice forward in a different situation. So mm. it, it's a lot more deliberate. Mm. And, and naturally also with, well, naturally, I don't know, but with the passage of time, perhaps I've also lost some of that frenetic energy mm. which was there in Paro, yeah. in the voice. Yeah. And as has the narrator herself. So, um, as I said, um, it, it's a novel about coming to terms with middle age and, and the pace of the book has changed like okay. that. Mm. Uh, and it is a naive voice in the sense that it, it is certainly not my voice. Mm. And um, in the device, in the way I've tried to tell it, mm, I've tried to tell more to the reader about Priya mm. than she knows she's giving away, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that her self-consciousness is of a particular level, but the reader gets a slightly larger overview sometimes. Yeah. What about the style? Is it a continuation of the first book or have you... Have you well, I've tried to keep the same. Uh, it can't be that breathless naturally, yeah, yeah. but it is uh, what No, but that's more the pace and the voice, but the style more or less. Well, it is a, what would be called a binda style in those days, yeah. or a style um, which looks at spoken English mm as uh, it is spoken around us, yeah. without too many um, self-conscious Hindiisms or mm. Bollywoodisms. Yeah. But um, I don't know, I've, I've tried a fine balance. And I, I think the, the continuity between the literary style of the first and this is there. You're writing for a completely different literary culture today, you know? Uh, the, the, uh, the critics, the reader, everything has evolved, everything has changed, right? So is it, is it, were you worried more in 1984 writing a book like that or were, are you worried more today? Well, I wasn't worried then, I wasn't worried now. Because I, I'm not very oversensitive to uh, criticism and to reactions. I mean, if people don't like it, I'll move on. 
and if they do like it, I'll be sort of happy and delighted that my efforts have paid off. And I, I don't, the, the literary environment has changed completely. Mm. But I don't think the subject matter, which is uh, the rich in Delhi yeah. and Mumbai in the sense of entitlement, I think they are still in a time warp. So I think yeah. there is, um, people like us are much the same now as they were then. Okay. Not that different. Okay. My final question would be about writing. This is the first sequel in a sense that you're writing. Tell me a little bit about challenge, the challenge of writing a sequel. Because in a sense, you're taking a story forward. In a sense, you're also writing a standalone book. Yes. You know? So wh 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 what was that process like for you? Um, yeah, that was part of the construction challenge. Yeah. And at first, I had a lot more of Priya, uh, of Paro in this book. Mm. And then I edited out large portions of that to make it a standalone book. It, it's different. And mm. what's, uh, what's been so enjoyable about it has been watching these characters change and speculate about how uh, life would go on and how they would move on. So there's uh, Priya's um, old uh, boss mm. and lover, B.R., who comes to life here again. Mm. There is um, her friend, Lenin, mm. the, Marxist the Marxist politician. Sign, yeah. So a lot of these people, when they come alive again, it, it was really a, a sort of a very enjoyable uh, um, game, watching them um, come alive on their own. Because of course, novelists don't bring things to life. You suddenly find these people have changed, and you're just jotting down how they've changed. And you know, when you say that you'd left the book behind, you know, yeah. uh, had you left these characters, did they ever come back to you when you were not even thinking of writing this book? Did they ever come back to you, these characters? Because they were such um, uh, true to life characters, you know, the characters that uh, one remembers. And if readers remember them the way they do, then, you know. Well, they did come back, stay with me in a floating yeah. consciousness kind of a way. But I have a really bad memory. And when I finish a book, I forget the names of the characters and I forget things like that. So I really had to read Paro all over again to connect again. And I read it very quickly because I had written it before. So, so it was a very funny game of knowing things and not knowing things. But for example, in this novel, um, I found that uh, Lenin loved to eat ice cream. And um, I mean, I didn't think much about it. And one day I read Paro again just to f check out some connections. And I found out that Lenin had loved ice cream. So clearly that had remained, you know, so little mm. cues and connections like that mm. must be remaining somewhere in my head.